I'm Craig Constantine. Welcome to the Movers Mindset Podcast, where I talk with movement enthusiasts to learn who they are, what they do, and why they do it. My guest today is Amina Sharif Ali. Welcome, Amina. How are you this morning, this afternoon? This afternoon. Hi, Craig. I'm doing well. I just came from training, so I'm Mm. doing good. I'm jealous. I went for a walk today, though, so it's not too bad. Um, uh, ooh, I know exactly where to begin, so I'm just jump, jumping right in. I, For those people listening who don't know, how do you not know this? I have a blog. Uh, just go to constantine.name. It doesn't have much to do with movers' mindsets. So I have like thousands of blog posts for decades. It's, it's, I'm sorry. I have a problem. But I found an article about punk about a month ago, and I, so I was going to write a blog post about it, and then I didn't quite, and I, I like put it down. And then I was talking to you last week or two weeks ago, and we started talking about punk. Okay. So here's the thing about punk people. The article that I read said that people who are really in the punk scene, punk is actually like at least two different things that are on like in an uneasy truce. They're sharing this name. Yeah, we're all punk, but they, there's kind of like the no true Scotsman thing going on inside punk. And then I talked to you and you're a self-described or you've outed yourself as a punk person. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> always have been right and you uh, mentioned an article that you wrote so the first thing uh that's my data point for people listening about punk the second thing is uh, amina wrote an article called on parkour and punk in case you didn't see that coming which is published in the magnificent little zine called once is never go to once is never.com buy them all so amina i don't know that i have a clear question for you about that thing about punk being multiple things, like when you are in it, um, and to use your own words, uh, you, Craig, throwing pieces of paper around at his desk. Um, yeah, there's a great thing you said about, it took me, here's me quoting Amina. Uh, This makes people really nervous when I quote them (laughs) in a call. It took me a long time to understand that in order to find my place within punk, I had to be an active participant in the conversation about what punk is and could and should be. So anybody listening, um, does this sound familiar? Like, do we do this within parkour? Is this a thing for us people? Uh, so let's let's talk about that. Can you tell me a little bit or a lot of it mm-hmm. about when you realized, because you mentioned this in your article, when you realized that that was also a thing with inside inside parkour for you, like how did that recognition that oh crud i've seen this this thing before how did that change the way you think about parkour or maybe how you approached your parkour practice yeah well um i will say yes i am a self-described punk although sometimes i i deem myself as a uh as a fake punk just to get out in front of the uh the haters um Mm -hmm. and kind of take it out of their mouths and claim it but um yeah i would say that um, I have, I definitely agree that there's at least two different things that uh, that punk is described as, or or you know, and by which I mean kind of two different kind of arenas in which we're kind of trying to even define what it is, and maybe a way to say it is one is descriptive and one is prescriptive. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the descriptive end, I'm thinking through like a musicological lens. And I, you know, I went to school for music. So I have this like, this kind of theoretical, sociological sometimes lens on like, what, what are the materials of this? And then there's another one, which can also be descriptive, but it is about like an ethos, a cultural piece, a philosophy, a, you know, um, aesthetics themes and um and i see that as well and so kind of in each of those arenas there's a fight for what constitutes punk and i would say i do see a parallel there with uh with parkour in terms of we can just you know break it down into like component descriptions on either on either the the physical side and technical side or as well as the philosophical side um and yeah you know then when i start to like go further and further down that conceptual or semantic rabbit hole and then i'm just like man (laughs) this this stuff is all just made up it's all it's all just fake you know like layers added by the people (laughs) yeah like gender or economic systems it's all Mm. it's it's invented and then people you know 
people enter into this not knowing like oh what what was already here what was you know what here do i have to accept as natural what here do i have to you know do i want to kind of mold in a particular direction because it appeals to me how conscious am i of that mm. um i agree with everything oh my goodness i uh, so for me when i started my parkour journey it was not uh, it was entirely selfish. Like I went and did the thing because I effing loved it. And then I like loved the people and I loved the spaces and it just, it was basically play, you know, for me. Um, and then later I came like years later, I came to this realization of like, Whoa, this is also about identity. Like how, do, how do I identify as myself? Like, what am I, what do I think of myself as? Um, and then it becomes this, for me, it became this vehicle of, uh, well, I can explore myself by going out and and paying attention to the things that I'm attracted mm -hmm. to, paying attention mm -hmm. to the types of movement, types mm -hmm. of people, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering if maybe you were able to run, um, I mean, we only have like really two data points here on the show, me and you, but I'm wondering if you were able to sort of run, oh, sorry, that's a, <laughs> see what I did there. If you're able to run that line a little more quickly because you had experienced it, like I'm just wondering how immediately obvious that was to you in your parkour journey. Cause it took me years before I really realized that that was a thing. I, th I think it, I think it was something that I started thinking about pretty, pretty soon in terms of analyzing yeah, what appeals to me and why does it appeal to me and how does that map to other things that either appeal to me or are deeply held values. And I do think that's a benefit of, of starting something like, like parkour um, a bit later. Uh, I, I was 38 when I first, you know, started training. I'm 41 now. Um, and after having, you know, articulated certain political values of mine, have after having come out as transgender, um, I think all of those have, you know, I've, I've already, you know, kind of broken the matrix a couple times um, for mm -hmm. myself. And, um, and, and I am, once you start to see, you know, those, you know, those, you know, green lines of code, <laughs> then you, <laughs> yes. um, then you, know, you don't, you don't unsee uh, them and it is, it, it, you know, and I start to see things, everything through, um, through those lenses, <laughs> lenses, excuse me, through yeah, those I lenses. <laughs> I mean, as you know, my article, you know, ends on this note of like saying parkour is punk as fuck, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that is my practice of parkour as I want it to be, as I think it's most inspiring and, um, and, uh, potent is consist consistent with my conception of what is so vital about punk is that it's raw and it's real and it's um and it's surprising and it's um it's meant you know it's um it's 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 got conviction to it um and so in my you know and i was just mentally preparing my, myself for coming in here just like one i jotted down a couple things not like a whole treatise but i one of the things i wrote down is parkour is trans <laughs> and I was just like, yeah. you know, fundamentally, you know, uh, I'm like, we're looking at a space, be it a large physical environment or one's body and being like, you know, we've been told this is what this space means and is for. And there's like a, no, I don't accept that. I don't accept that. That's and, the al and the alternative is not like the, uh, by default, uh, often I fall for this. When I talk about a space, I start by saying, okay, here's a space and these are the railings and this is the ramp for easier access. And then I describe the, the trans version of it as like a lesser, oh, but there's also this other thing here that you might notice. And, I, and it's, it's sort of like I'm by default representing them differently. Like one, I'm, I'm automatically or not automatically by default, I still present the what everybody thinks of as the common way as like, yeah, that's the common way, but it's not really the common way. It's the space doesn't actually have meaning. It's just this objective reality. Mm -hmm. So I think there's still, and I don't know what people think when they hear me talking about stuff, but for me, there's still this lesson of, yeah, but I still think of the norm, uh, the normal or the, 
if you grabbed a random person. I still think of that by default. That's what I think of first. Mm -hmm. And then my parkour vision is always the, oh, and also. And right. that, oh, right. and also is like rail balances for days. Mm -hmm. Whoa, who built mm -hmm. this space, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I still, th I, th I think you're, you make a good point there about it being trans or, or um, transformative or it being um, mm -hmm. punk. Yeah, the two different yeah. things, but like it, it's that and it's that. And it's also, it's very punk-like. Yeah. Um, I don't know dearly yeah. about punk. Like I, I don't think I could even necessarily name a punk band. I'm not trying to diss punk. It's just, I've never oh, was in that yeah. scene. So I don't have a lot of punk terminology to deploy. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, uh, that's cool. You know, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I mean, I, and it's something I'll just put in here is that, you know, politically I am definitely a whole ass anarchist, um, of, of, of a revolutionary anti-capitalist an abolitionist, all these things. And I don't say that because I'm here because I need to proselytize it to anyone. Um, but I do just bring it in to say that, you know, that informs my, um, my vision about about mm -hmm. how to describe these things and i definitely you know I, I would call that that what you say the kind of normal description i mean i i use the word normative right that there's um this is the uh first dictionary definition as described by you know our society with the power structures that our society is comprised right. of and and yeah, so we could say, yeah, so here's a municipal building that houses these offices and it's got this kind of construction, uh, which is part of this ac architectural trend to be imposing in this way. And then it's also got this ramp over here. That's a result. The reason it has that is because of the uh, ADA and, um, and here's some of the different features of that, or here's, you know, and we could describe them with those, you know, we could contextualize all that historically and be like here's why they are what they are and then um and here's here's what the normative described use is and also um um i yeah i am i am for you know broadly speaking um maximal autonomy and self-determination and uh in kind of really all spheres of life um and uh and you know including you know how do we use like really any space and you know yeah so you know and i think this is very much in play when when there's security you know telling you to like oh you, you can't you can't do that because you're like do that walkway you're, clear you can't do that because i can because you're scaring the shoppers or yeah uh, uh, whose problem is that sorry um mm -hmm. that's a whole other thing uh, so I was just thinking um, the, and sometimes I feel like, okay, these shows would be a lot better if I really, if we really had planned this out because then we could have all our fancy words lined up. But there's a, there's a concept whose words escape me where talking about a lot of times when we, when I talk about parkour, I wind up having conversations with people that we couldn't have if I said, let's talk about religion or let's talk about political science, like some topics are, they either are the third rail, you know, don't touch that, you get electrocuted or they're too close to the third rail. But mm. somebody has to be pretty irrational and insane for a discussion about use of the space in front of the municipal building, if that's not something that we can actually talk about. I mean, I've been chased out of those spaces, but I've also had random people walk up to me who were at first like, what are you doing? And then when you talk about it a little bit, like mm -hmm. it's a conversation you can have because yeah. it's like, yeah, it's concrete. It's a railing. It's a picnic table. And, and I'm on the picnic bench, you know, doing scoot vaults or something. Mm -hmm. So it's like parkour can there's something about moving in the space that, I mean, it does threaten some people who see it, but most people, you can kind of engage them on that. But if you try to talk about religion or uh, non stand like cis versus transgender, like if you try and talk about that kind of stuff, it, you don't get very far before people mm -hmm. just lose their, lose their minds. Um, yeah. So I think it's good in a way that the, anybody who does parkour, whether they think we're talking smack at the moment or, or whether we're talking interesting, mm -hmm they're going to wind up starting those conversations, <laughs> even if they're right. slapping graffiti on stuff and jumping off roofs, they're still going to wind up starting conversations that get people to think more about, yeah, why is this the normative? Like, why, why can't we be on roofs? Like what's wrong? What's actually uh -huh. wrong with that? You know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, uh, so I'm just wondering if maybe it 
feels like a, an easier lift than punk. Like, I don't know how long you were in punk, but like, did punk ever feel like that where you could actually have a conversation with, I don't know if punk people have a term for non-punk people, but like, did it ever posers. feel like <laughs> posers? <laughs> did it ever feel like you could have a conversation with posers about punk and it would actually be useful in any way? Or is it just like, no, that's the, that's the antimatter. Um, that's a good question. You know, it's funny to think of like being in punk or not in punk as like a, a, a known quantity. Um, it is funny. It is this thing that like I knew I was, I gravitated towards and I like, you know, really wrung my hands for years about like, oh, but can I claim that, you know, the music I make is not exactly that, but it's informed by that. And, you know, and I really, you know, I would dare say like kind of went and like did my homework more than a lot of people in terms of being like, what the hell? is this and i did the same as you know from the blog i did the same thing with parkour i was like mm -hmm. oh my god i got to everything that. right yep. you know I, you know so i um um and yeah and something that i am glad that i know about all these you know different cultural phenomena or whatever is that they don't get authored by a single authority you know they they get um authored dialectically and collectively um, and, you know, when I think about like the idea of like kind of idolizing or fetishizing like the Yamakaze or David Bell in particular about like being like, that's the articulation of what parkour is. I'm like, bruh, that is a bunch of kids in a totally different cultural context than you probably, unless you live that's in really important in the late cultural. 80s, early 90s, yes. you know? Yes. And, um, up, up, you know, and they were into like, you know, Dragon Ball and Bruce Lee and they like just started like doing this stuff and then they got obsessive about, mm -hmm. you know, crushing reps and getting, you know, as, like strong. And I mean, it's interesting. It's cool. But like, you know, and, but, I, you know, and I similar to punk, I'm like, I'm like, OK, I'm looking at like what the 60s, like a bunch of like freaking like weirdos in you know like in 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 you know new york you know like doing a bunch of drugs and making like you know they're like weird music and hanging out with andy warhol and what you know like i'm like mm. i'm like you know i can be like interested in it without fetishizing it you know i can also i can be like the things that drew me to this that inspire me about it came later and they came by people who you know like you know they the you know they they built on those important foundations but i also i don't have to worship the foundations any more than i have to like worship hegel to uh, appreciate marx or be a marxist for instance mm. for instance <laughs> going deep um I, <laughs> yeah. what i was just thinking was there's um one doesn't need to really understand like this could be a danger. You can end up in cults this way, but one doesn't need to understand all of what is underneath in order to get the benefits from doing or practicing or, or going after a thing. Um, so for me, when I started in parkour, I had no idea of any of the roots of anything that I was doing. It was just like, it was a bunch of people that I met wound up becoming friends and it was just, well, this is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. so in that sense, <clears throat> I lucked out, you know, both the cultural and the social context that I'm in, I can do that without getting shot or arrested, you know, and that, that works for me. Like my, my skin, the skin of my color, the color of my skin, the place that I'm in, if I get caught on a rail and the cops are like, get off of there. You know, like that's mm -hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's possible for me to just go on the journey without having to actually unpack um, all of the nuance and all of the history. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm wondering is, so twice now you've kind of gone deep on the unpacking before really diving in. And I'm wondering if you feel like, like I would say most people that I know dive in, they do what I did. They just do the thing. And then later on they discover all this other social and societal and philosophical stuff that goes with anything you take up as like a real in, you know, close to your heart activity. I'm just wondering if you think, is there, a, is there like a, is it better to do it one way versus the other? Or is it just everybody's journey is different? Like, do you feel like maybe you were handicapped in a way by having gone too deep before you started jumping on shit? Like, nah, I don't think so. I, well, one, I was already jumping on shit, you know, albeit at a, at a beginning level, level, 
before I started like really trying to, you know, follow the breadcrumb trail back or whatever. But I, um, yeah, you know, um, something to put in here is that I've always only trained at the streets. I think I've set foot in a parkour gym like one time, like, you know, well, well over a year <clears throat> after I had begun. And I, um, yeah, there's nothing like that. That's maybe I would go if it was more accessible to me, but there's nothing that's like right there for me. So, um, and I, it's also, you know, street based movement that I love. Cause I, I, I'm in love with the creativity of that and the way in which it transforms, um, a space and the, all the, all the just like really, um, surprising and subtle ways that one can interact with a space in a way that's different from how it's norm normatively articulated and how that transforms it and, you know, and makes us see it differently. And, um, and that, you know, so I started doing that, um, by myself during the pandemic and it was, you know, one, I will say that that, you know, it wasn't necessarily easy, but I broke that, self-consciousness barrier like pretty early and um and now it's pretty straightforward to train on the streets and people walking by and i would also say it was somewhat easier for me because i'm used to from like political activity like the ways in which tr spaces can get transformed the ways in which like this like park in front of city hall that fucking nobody actually uses that's not that it's like technically a kind of quote unquote green public space but nobody uses mm -hmm. can get transformed into an encampment where people are really trying to provide um for for everybody including and share resources and um and have truly democratic processes this you know road that everybody walks down this freeway can we can walk up this freeway ramp and we can block block this freeway and you know and it's so thrilling to see how that can happen and to to notice what happens internally um when those things happen and i think just having kind of cut my teeth on a lot of that made it easier to be like oh yeah like there's so many ways to be in space differently than how we're told i mean you know just to bring in another thread i'll, I'll bring in the whole kind of i was just thinking about this recently um queer cruising spots and the history, the long decades long history of that. And like having like uh, both social space and like space to be sexually active and intimate in public spaces that, you know, um, like be they like the woods or, you know, bathhouses or, you know, whatever, you know, and like how, and how that has been, uh, you know, born of, you know, homophobia and transphobia, but it has been, an important place for people at the margins to find community, to find like relatively safer ways to connect um, and to find, you know, and to use a public space that really was not being used for jack shit else in a way that is actually like, you know, transformative and vital. Hmm. One of the problems with profound things is there's nothing you can say after that. So I don't have anything to say. <laughs> That's as good as that. I, I think that people, I don't really know anybody who only does parkour. I feel like everybody that I can think of who is really like into parkour, whether or not they call it parkour in their head, that's a whole nother discussion. But whichever flavor of punk you are, mm -hmm. those people also, are, I'm just thinking, are passionate about other things. So but you're obviously passionate about other topics, duh, Craig. But I'm thinking, I feel like people who are drawn to parkour may also have other, I don't know, transformative passions already. And then parkour. So, so, so I've, always, I've always heard people say, and I've often thought this myself, that parkour is like this, this thing that you discover and then it changes the way you see the world and it's a very transformative thing for you personally and parkour can be transformative for the world. But that kind of like puts it in a, in a glass box, like parkour mm. is this thing, here it is over here. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then I like take off my suit and I go back to my day job kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it, it feels like maybe what's really going on is people are already somehow aware that there can be a transformation. In your case, punk was a big thing. And then parkour is another opportunity to experience transformation. So yes, this feels comfortable, like right out of the gate. I mean, there's always the physical discomfort, like, you know, muscles hurt and there's the self, um, self-aware, uh, what do you call it? Self can't find the word self critical, mm. you know, I'm out in public, but beyond those things, those are pretty easy to get over this idea of, Ooh, I could also do this thing as a way to transform me in the world. Um, so now I'm just thinking people may, it may be what really calls people to parkour is not that they're a certain type of person, but that they've experienced transformation somewhere else. Mm. And they see that maybe not consciously, but they see that inside parkour as another opportunity to again, find that new experience of transformation. Hmm. I yeah, know. I don't, I don't know, know if that's true. That, Just a thought I had. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. You know, I don't know if I if I registered like a transformative potential in parkour when I first began it or when I. Yeah. But what I'll say when I think about like waves of successive transformation, um, I can think of, you know, probably at least half a dozen off the top of my head that, you know, that. You know, I think about when I went to music school and certain things I encountered there conceptually in terms of society and art turned my head around. And when I, um, you know, when I first fell in love, things that turned my head around about the what the what it could mean or when I, you know, really got politicized um, it to a new degree during the Occupy movement, how that like transformed me or when I went back to school mm -hmm. to become a therapist and like what I the frameworks I started using to conceptualize people and how they are in relationships and, um, and the forces that drive us internally. Um, so these are, these are kind of transformative conceptual frameworks that have like influenced me, but something I think critically uh, that I'm going to use from the last one there is that um, they haven't displaced each other. They uh, they've necessarily in order for it to be really be like a, a, a meaningful transformation and not just like a, some kind of flailing, you know, um, um, I, I might call it spiritual mm. bypassing. Um, it has to be integrated with what was already there. So if my whole worldview when I was a teenager was like, I'm a diehard romantic. And then I also get into whatever avant-garde art, avant-garde like art, um, in, um, in college, you know, how do I integrate that, that kind of, ethos and with, you know, with my teenage romantic self and how do I integrate being an anarchist and a communist with, with that? And how do I integrate being a psychodynamic like therapist with that? And how do I integrate being a trans woman with that? And, you know, and layers on layer, but, you know, but ne none of them displaces any of the others. They, they, you know, they, they enrich it all. And so, um, where was I going with that? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, well, I, I guess I'll just say that, you know, um, parkour has been transformative to me and it hasn't displaced any of those things. It's, it's, it's found a way to like, I've to, to meld and keep like, you know, extending the analogies of each to the others and, mm -hmm. and each is kind of enriching mm -hmm. the other. And I, um, I would say that I'm just kind of glad to have encountered parkour at the time that I did when I feel like my values were like pretty well articulated and pretty well integrated uh, with each other is such that, you know, that I, uh, such that I didn't feel like a pressure to have like a whole ready-made philosophy that I could just plug in mm -hmm. and assume right. as an identity. Um, but uh, that could, could play with all that other mind. stuff that was already there. Yeah. Um, what I was just thinking was, I, some, like, I forget. Not everybody can hear what I'm thinking, so I'm almost always thinking whenever I'm recording anything. I'm not. I hope that people don't think that I'm expecting anything that we're saying to give you some answer. Like I'm not expecting people to go like, Oh, I get it now. And like slap their headphones off. And then you know, it's like, they've had a revelation. Uh -huh. It's more like I'm hoping always when I'm recording that, that people find 
that the conversation makes them either see a new perspective or, or at the very least, understand the other person across from me, you know, a little better at the very least. Um, new perspective would be great. And um, having them come away with a new question would really be awesome because questions are like the greatest thing ever uh, <clears throat> when one has a question. Uh, so this is not an easy question to answer, but like, can you think of, is there a question that you would like to give to people? And, and maybe it's a question that, that like caught you, like, you know, how do I integrate my avant-garde art with romantis? Like it can be something more nuts and boltsy like that, or it could be like a really strange question that you're imagining, um, you know, to like would really hook people. I'm not, I'm sure if that, if that makes sense as a question, like what's a question that you think would be good to plant into people's minds? I, this is off just off the top, but trying to formulate that right now, I am thinking about, you know, what is one's identity and values, values both with regard to who you want to be or become as well as what kind of world you want to see and how does parkour, how does a practice of parkour and like for yourself and kind of broadly as a social phenomenon, how does it integrate with, with those values, with that identity? I think that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> integration is always a challenge. How does one integrate? That's a challenge. Um, that's, that's a good question. And the beauty of podcasts, people can rewind. We don't have to repeat it. Just rewind and listen to it again. Um, all right. Well, I'm watching our time slip away, which is like my turn signal for it. It's about a half hour. Um, so, Amina, that was super awesome. Uh, I think I will just say, and of course, the final question, three words to describe your practice. Fantasy authenticity and quality. Terrific. Uh, like I said, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I always appreciate when people take the leap when I say, Hey, would you like to join me? Cause I'm not super famous. Um, but you were super generous with your time in our pre-call and here today. So thanks for sharing your viewpoint, your perspective. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs>